Rust's table recently got async await support. Let me show you how to use this killer feature. Async await allows executors to run async tasks represented by futures. Executors are part of asynchronous runtimes, which are a few available on Crytes.io right now. It may be surprising that the language feature cannot work without external dependencies, but here the idea is for users to choose whatever runtime fits their needs. In this video, let's use Tokyo, a very popular runtime which supports async await currently in the latest alpha version. If you're seeing this in the future, Tokyo probably is stable right now. But let's get to some actual coding. Let's start with writing some async code which will open a socket, write some data and close it. I've got an empty project already prepared here. First let's import our standard Tokyo preload. Tokyo preload everything. And now let's write our first asynchronous function. We do that by first specifying the word async, which means the function will be asynchronous, then standard fn and the name. Let's call it write data. And inside, let's open our TCP stream. I already have a simple listening socket ready in the background, so this should work. Let's use the TCP stream from Tokyo because it's asynchronous and use the connect method. And now we are stumbling upon our first usage of async. You see the connect function is also asynchronous. And that means its result is not available immediately upon its exit. Instead, the actual result of this call will be available at some time in the future. To get it, the simplest way is to add dot .await. Dot .await means let's wait until the thing which we are calling actually completes its operation. In this case, we are waiting for the socket or the TCP stream to connect to the remote endpoint. Underneath, Tokyo is most likely waiting for some system event to occur. And that waiting time is essentially wasted when doing normal synchronous programming. If this was a synchronous connect function, we would simply wait until the system connects our socket to remote endpoint and our thread will be, well, blocked. This is wasteful. By using async and await, we are creating an implicit resume point and the thread can continue doing something else while the connect is taking place. When we get a notification from the underlying system that the connection has been established, the execution resumes as usual, as if nothing asynchronous actually happened, while in fact some other code might have been running and we wouldn't even know. Okay, so let's unwrap our result because we know it will succeed. And now let's simply write something, whatever, stream, write all, binary, test. And also, this is an async call, so we need to await until it completes. What this means in practice is that the data will be asynchronously written and flushed by the underlying OS socket implementation. And while it's doing that, our process will continue running something else. And of course, let's unwrap the result. We have our first asynchronous uh, function, pretty simple one. Now let's create our main function and call it. At this point, Tokyo provides us with a very helpful attribute, Tokyo main, which is nothing else but a asynchronous wrapper around our main function. So instead of writing simply fn main, we write async main, and now our main function is asynchronous rather than the usual case. Here we simply call our write data and again we await until it completes. So to recap, what's happening here? First we enter our main function which calls our write data function which tries to asynchronously connect to an endpoint. 
and awaits until it completes. While it's waiting, the thread can do something else. In our simple example, well, there is nothing else to do, but in complex scenarios, you would have a ton of asynchronous tasks running all in parallel, or rather, all concurrently. When the connection is established, our wait time is over, and we resume execution just like nothing happened. So we unwrap the result, we write some data, again, we await until the host operating system writes it all, and we unwrap the result. The same case is here. Since write data is asynchronous, we also await until it completes and we exit from main. Thanks to Tokyo, the runtime underneath it all awaits until our main function completes. By just looking at the code, you might wonder, how is this different from a standard synchronous string? And you might really say that it's not. And that's actually good. The code just looks synchronous, but it's not. It's fully asynchronous, but it doesn't contain chains of callbacks and continuation like it was the case earlier. It looks like a normal sequence of instructions. You have your connect, you have your write data, and that's it. You get all the benefits of readable code with the benefits of being asynchronous. Beside whole functions, we can also create asynchronous blocks. So let's create one here. Let the block equals async and let's put everything inside and simply await our block. Now you might notice that the block variable is being of the type future or rather it's an implementation of a future. That's what the async task is wrapped into. Future is a trait in the standard library which specifies what the result type is and which contains a poll method which is called by an executor to start processing and check if the future has the result ready. An async block is implicitly converted to some unspecified future implementation, as we can see here, impl future. And our whole async function is also a syntactic sugar for an async block. So if we move async here, we remove the variable here. We actually need to add a move keyword, which I will talk about in a second. And the result of such function is some implementation of a future with an output being an empty tuple. We can run the code so you will see everything works just fine. If we press run, you'll see finished running exit code zero, everything works. Simply writing async before the function declaration makes all of this future stuff transparent to the programmer. Before diving deeper into how futures work, let's first talk about passing arguments to futures. Move keyword allows data to be moved inside the async block. Without move, the data gets barred just like a simple lambda. Let's pass some data and see how it works in practice. So our data here would be a slice of some bytes. Here we simply pass the data around and pass our test string here. Let's build it. And we have an error. This no longer builds. The problem is that the future captures the reference to our data, which means the lifetime of the future must take the lifetime of the data into account. So we need to write some lifetimes here, here, and here, and try to build it again. Works just fine. Now, having that out of the way, let's talk about the poll method. You probably will rarely need to implement your own future, simply use async blocks and async functions, but in any case, let's talk about how to make that happen. The poll method gets a pinned reference to self, which I will not talk about now because it's a broader topic which can you read about in the documentation. And also the future, or rather the poll method, takes a reference to a context which I will talk about later. The function must return ready if the result is available or pending if the future waits for some result to be ready. For example, it waits for the operating system to make a socket connection. It also will not be called before somebody asks it for the result. This means the future starts its work only when somebody wants it to start. If nobody starts the future, it doesn't do anything, so it's basically free in that sense. But you might wonder, 
Does that mean that futures get actively polled until the result is ready? It would seem so, right? Well, no. That would mean they are no different than simple busy waiting. Instead, the future should clone something called a waker from the context when it's getting polled and call wake on it when the result is available. This makes futures inform executors they finish their work and the execution can continue. From the user's perspective, all of this happens transparently when using await. When we get back to what I said in the beginning, we can see now how the executor executes async tasks using futures. The executor gets a task wrapped in a future and calls Paul, then waits for the waker to become, well, awakened. Okay, I hope this short tutorial showed you how async await works. I hope I showed you the basics of it all. It really helps programs make use all of the time wasted on waiting for external events to happen. Again, like connecting or writing data to a socket. Or pretty much most of I.O. you can think about. Of course, don't mistake this for parallel execution. Async await helps you run code while other code waits patiently for futures to complete, while parallel execution executes code in parallel. What does that mean in practice? Well, if we have a runtime which supports only one thread, and we have two asynchronous tasks, then only one task can be run at the same time, but it can be suspended while it waits for something, and then the other task will start to run. As you can see, async and await are really easy to use, are really intuitive, are really readable, in contrast to all those continuation callbacks. So I hope you found this informative and interesting. If you have any questions, post them down below, click subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.